This episode is brought to you by Vital Farms. Isn't it bullshit to have to question where your food comes from? At Vital Farms, you can trace your pasture-raised eggs all the way back to the source, the pasture. On the side of each pasture-raised carton of eggs, you'll find the name of the farm where your eggs were laid. And when you look the farm up on their website, you'll get a peek at all the sunshine, fresh air, and open space the hens enjoy. Learn more and find out where to buy them at vitalfarms.com. Vital Farms, keeping it bullshit free. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics. Our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. Search for Economist Podcasts Plus and sign up to our free one-month trial. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card, the credit card created by Apple. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that you can now choose to grow in a high-yield savings account that's built right into the Wallet app. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility requirements. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. It's time to say goodbye to hold music and say hello to fast customer support with Service Cloud. With trusted AI and data working together, you can skip long wait times and deliver efficient, personalized service right away. All while keeping support costs low and more customers happy. Reimagine your customer support with the number one AI CRM for service. Learn what's possible at Salesforce.com/products/service. This episode is brought to you by Clavio, the platform that powers smarter digital relationships. With Clavio, you can activate all your customer data in real time, connect seamlessly with your customers across all channels. Guide your marketing strategy with AI-powered insights, recommendations, and automated assistance. Deliver experiences that feel individually designed at scale and grow your business faster. Power smarter digital relationships with Clavio. Learn more at clavio.com/spotify. That's k-l-a-v-i-y-o.com/spotify. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. Where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon, even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Neil Bedwell about why HR practitioners should think and work like marketers to build belief, fuel adoption, and create opportunities for all employees to become owners of change in their organizations. Neil Bedwell, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Hey, John, good to be with you. It is great to be with you. You're joining us from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about a really fascinating topic. As we were preparing for this interview and you shared some potential questions with me, I was looking through and thinking through them. And this is the one that really stuck out. Why HR practitioners should think and work like marketers to build belief fuel adoption, and create opportunities for all employees to become owners of change in their organizations. Now, that's a big, long question. Uh, it has so many different components that we're going to dissect and pull apart, uh, but that just really spoke to me. I, I, I really like the change management piece. I like the personal ownership piece. I like thinking about strategic marketing, thinking of ourselves as strategic marketers and, and functioning in HR in a way that will be effective and impactful. Um, all of that, I think, is so important in the modern HR and leadership space. 
So this is what we're going to be exploring together today. As we get started, I wanted to share Neil's bio with everybody. Neil Bedwell is a partner and president at Local, a change marketing consultancy, building culture, employee experience, and internal communication programs for some of the world's best companies. Neil is a strategic marketing leader with 20 years experience on both agency and client side, running work, teams, and businesses in London, Amsterdam, and San Francisco. Now a reformed marketer, Neil and the local team bring consumer-grade agency craft to internal audiences to deliver meaningful organizational change at a wide variety of Fortune 500 companies, including Capital One, Coca-Cola, Republic Services, UPS, P&G, Kaiser Permanente, and others. Before co-founding Local, Neil led digital strategy and content for Coca-Cola's global content excellence group. His work included leadership of the digital program for the 2014 FIFA World Cup in Brazil, developing new ways to create and publish content in real time across multiple social channels and managing global digital agency relationships. Fascinating. We could go on and on. Um, I'm going to pause there and give you a chance to share with listeners anything else about yourself, your story, your background as it might contribute to the context for the conversation. Oh, I love it. Well, you got my life story there and some, <laughs> some good flashbacks, not least if any, if there are any soccer fans listening, um, how well the U S did in 2014 in Brazil and how badly the, the English did, you know? And so I was a, I was a USA fan longer than I was an England fan down there, but uh, incredible experience. Um, I was only going to just pick up on one thing you said, um, a buddy of mine, when I was explaining, you know, what I do now versus what I've done my whole career, it's like, oh, so you're like a reformed marketer. You like you've come through the program and you've popped out the other side and you're, um, I guess I still am a marketing guy. Um, I just, we have a slightly different, uh, lens on how right. you think and apply marketing. So, um, this is an, a, you know, a human, humans at work focused podcast that you're running, John. And I'm a marketing guy showing up like a ringer um, in hand. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I'd love to talk about how, you know, marketing is not a vertical discipline. Yeah. But a yeah. set of skills. I, I want to call it a mindset, honestly. Yeah. That everybody should take on. So um, if that, that's, if I could leave one thing after all this time spent in all those places that you just mentioned, it would be to try and reframe how people think about about marketing. So uh. it's interesting because I take the exact same kind of approach to HR. Um, I think of HR as a mindset and a toolkit that any organizational leader from lowest supervisory level all the way up through senior executive and CEO need to understand. They need to have a people centric orientation. They need to focus on how to be most effective to help teams, you know, dynamically have psychologically safe um, places to work and innovate and create and add value to the market. Um, so I think of HR in a very similar way that you're talking about marketing. And what the nice thing about that is when we start to talk about mindsets and skill sets, um, that then become, they're not siloed and they're transferable and they can be, they can really get enmeshed across the different kind of traditional functional areas that we often talk about in business so that we can leverage, you know, our capabilities for more impact. Uh, and that's, you know, as I think of myself as an HR person or as a leader, I think, you know, one of my weaknesses, frankly, is marketing, PR, sales. Like those are all things I wish I did better. And I, I fully recognize that for me to be the most impactful leader I can be, I need to be better in those areas and I need to develop myself in those areas. So as much as I, I feel like I'm very competent and capable in the HR people centered space, um, let's, let's bring in the, the marketing mindset. And that's only going to help me be more effective. That's going to help me speak the language that other people are going to hear. That's going to help me uh, to accomplish what I want to accomplish for the organization, for my team for me and my career and my own development. Right. Right. Well, if you'll take a compliment first off, uh, as a listener to HCI, you, you are doing pretty good. There's, there's <laughs> you're bringing Thank you. some marketing, uh, <laughs> jobs to this. So, so, uh, don't beat yourself up too much, but, um, so I've been known to, to, uh, get on my soapbox and pitch, uh, kind of a, an idea around this, that in the future, the, 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 next, the next companies that lead and change industries need to think about um, not the marketing team and the HR team, but a team that I call humanity. 
Because think about this, right? You, you already said this. There is a group inside every organization that looks after uh, a group of human beings uh, that we call customers. This is the marketing team. And we spend our, you know, I've been doing this for 20, 20 years. We spend every minute of our time thinking about that group of people and how we might find a meaningful place in their busy lives. No matter whether we're selling uh, soda or cars or, you know, airline tickets. And then there's another group of people inside the same organization who are looking after um, another body. They just happen to be called employees, but they're still human beings. They still have the same motivations. They still, you know, they're still, they're still, still the same emotional, illogical, you know, creative, fantastic individuals. Yet we treat them entirely differently. We seek to um, manage them as resources. Don't get me started on the term HR. Um, but and, and we don't we don't apply the same level of care that we do to the people on the outside. But they're the same people, you know. The your your, your employees are your customers, um, and your customers are your employees. They they respond to almost all of the same thing. So the, the idea of this one group that thinks about the people on the outside and the people on the inside together actually makes kind of kind of good sense. I mean, think of it this way. Uh, somebody told me, and I wish I had the stat for this, maybe I can find it for, for you guys to, to, to give the backup, but as an, a long-time advertising guy, you have to come to, to uh, the, the, real, the, the realization that what I do as an advertising guy in my past life is no longer the greatest driver of brand value. Customer service is the greatest driver of brand value right now, and to give you a sense of um, of, of what brand value is, if uh, you're not familiar with it, it's the intangible value created by um, my association, relationship, connection to, you know, your brand, your name, your uh, the, the, the position you hold in the world. Uh, when I worked at Coca-Cola, the market cap of Coca-Cola, 44% of its entire value was was brand. So 44% of its potential to generate income comes from this, this, this intangible thing that lives out there sort of in the hearts and minds of the, of, of, of the audience. That's where brand lives. It, brand doesn't, it doesn't exist tangibly. It lives in my heart. Um, so if you take the greatest driver of brand value being customer service, who delivers customer service? The employees. So good employee experience, which is often you know, created by HR teams, drives customer service, customer experience. EX drives CX. And actually it's kind of an infinity loop. It's like an engine. More, the more you put into EX, the more you, you, you get out of CX, which generates more revenue, more, more growth, yep, which allows yep. you to develop better um, employee experiences and, and have more employees. And then round and round it goes. Why isn't that one team? Why isn't that one group of people work, working on that, that human engine uh, rather than two groups that really sit at two different ends of the building. Um, yeah, that human engine. I love that. And when I talk about people-centric organizations, you know, some people use that terminology to talk about an HR mentality and framework around the, the employee experience. I actually mean exactly what you're saying. When I talk about a people-centric organization, I'm talking about um, internal and external, all stakeholders in the organization. You have a human approach. You have a people-centered approach. And that's exactly what you just described. Um, let's do that more. Because like you said, the, the research is very, very clear on this. I've done a good amount of research in this space myself as an academic. Um, better employee experience, more engaged, more satisfied employees, that leads to much higher levels of customer loyalty and retention and customer satisfaction, right? And so yeah. as you do that, it's, it's increasing the bottom line. It's just one of those metrics that if you focus on employee experience, it's going to increase the bottom line. It's just not, it's not just warm, fuzzy, fluffy HR oh, stuff. Yeah. It's, it's actually going to make a measurable difference. And that's just one metric, you know, how it's impacting the customer experience. But you also then talk about um, employer brand. So you, you talked about branding uh, on the consumer side, but talk about it in terms of the employee side. Uh, an employer brand is really important, especially in this day and age where, we're, where companies are struggling to find good talent. You know, there's certain industries already, you know, in particular in, in technology areas, STEM fields and those sorts of things, 
that they, they've been struggling for a long time to get good people. And now you, you put on top of that, the great resignation and so many people leaving and looking for other opportunities, you better have a good value proposition to bring new good employees, qualified employees into your organization. If you hope to have a good team. And then when they get there, they better have a really good experience. Otherwise they're going to leave and they're going to go somewhere else. So what better way to, you know, increase customer loyalty, retention, and satisfaction, which will drive sales and revenue uh, lower turnover related costs. Uh, it's a, it's a win-win, right? And yet we still tend to have these separate silos. They don't really talk to each other that much, even though there's the goal is ultimately the same thing. A hundred percent. The problem I see is that those you're absolutely right. EX drives CX, CX drives, um, eventually drives growth. But they're not, those metrics are not, and measurements are not hardwired. And actually what you need, we've got to bring the CFO into our little humanity group here, and maybe the COO. Yeah, it's, going to be, it's going to be busy. But um, that, so, so that, that wiring has not yet been made. But I believe it will be. I believe that the, the big disruptive businesses you know, in the next decade or, or, or even less are going to wire that through and, and recognize that, you know, they, the, the main reason people are leaving companies is not pay. It's because they don't feel valued. It's because they don't feel respected. They don't feel like they're making an impact. You can wire that um, so that you are connected to the results of your labors. And we want to feel that when we, you know, we spend half our waking lives doing, you know, doing this thing called work, most of us. And that when you put something in that you want to see what comes out the other end, uh, and, and to know that when you put more in, more comes out. And it doesn't have to be money, but it can be impact. Um, and then, you know, the, the joy and, and, and the fun and the experience that I have at work, which, which means that I'm, I maybe put, want to put more in. I mean, you know, I'm pulling stats from, from, from different places during the conversation. You probably heard this one, but Gallup, every year, and, and even, even with our, the last two years, and we don't need to go down that, 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 pathway everybody knows what that was like the numbers have been pretty consistent it's so around two-thirds of uh, working adults are disengaged unhappy at work Actively disengaged, <laughs> <Actively> disengaged. <laughs> and you know I, I always talk about the it, it's very sad to see someone unhappy particularly with something they spend so much time doing but the cost of that misery what you're talking about the un the untapped potential the unmet um, growth because you didn't invest in those in those human beings. HR is a cost. Should be in, it should be seen as an investment. Humans, um, at, at the same way that you know marketing can be treated as a cost as opposed well, to and, yeah. And and I'll add to that. So sometimes people bristle to this terminology, and I don't mean to. Uh, you'll you'll hear what I'm mm. what I mean in just a second as I say it. I don't mean to diminish people. Humans are individual. Um, in, you know, people that deserve honor, respect, uh, they need to be treated well. Um, but if we stop for a second and just simple bottom line approach to all of this, and if we're trying to think of HR not as a cost center, but as an investment opportunity mm -hmm. into the people asset. So if I think of my people as capital or as an asset, now I don't want to dehumanize and I, I understand that, but just let's talk about it for the bottom line um, uh, component to this for a moment people as an asset or people as capital within an organization, think about all the other forms of capital or assets that companies utilize to, to add value to the market. We have financial capital, we have plant equipment, property, we have intellectual um, property, we have, you know, all these different forms, right? We have financial capital, of course, um, and we have the human capital, we have the human asset. Now think about a piece of equipment, heavy machinery, say you're in a factory, if you are paying millions of dollars for this piece of equipment, you're, I guarantee that you're going to be investing in maintenance oh, and upkeep it. of yeah. that equipment, right? To operate it, to keep it up to date, to, to add new um, elements to it over time, to do upgrades, maintenance, all of that. You're going to invest a lot to make sure that that still functions. Uh, and you can, you can say the th same thing about any other form of asset or capital. So let's think about that now in terms of the human capital or the human asset. If we're willing to put so much investment into the sustainability and maintenance of a piece of equipment, why in the world would we not be willing to invest a fraction of that, that 
cost for maintenance into the people of the organization that are ultimately the ones that are adding value, the ones that are creating and innovating and interfacing with the customers. It's insanity in my mind that, that companies aren't more willing to invest into to take an investment approach and mentality towards the HR function. Um, yet, you know, in many organizations, especially in times of recession or, or whatever, that's the first thing that they cut is they, they scale back. Um, and instead of investing, leaning into the investment and development of their people, which are going to help them ride out the storm, they end up um, shortchanging them. And like you said, people, you know, most people aren't leaving because of money per se. Um, they're leaving for a variety of other reasons that we can build into the employee experience and help people have more meaningful and engaging types right. of jobs with meaning and purpose. Um, but when you're actively uninvesting or disinvesting in your people uh, and undermining their sense of perceived value in the organization, regardless of whatever the pay actually is, that is going to be a big driver for people to leave. People want to be seen. They want to be heard. They want to feel valued. And if they, they know that the organization doesn't see them as worthy of maintenance, investment, upskilling, reskilling, et cetera, then of course people are going to be uh, looking for other opportunities because this is just one going to be one step in their long career journey. Totally. I mean, let's let's follow that thing through with think about the piece of machinery and then the the piece of humanity, right? This this individual, uh, uh, you know, a person at work is the only asset to follow that through. Um, that is uh, where the expectation is that it services itself, where, that it looks after itself, that it updates itself, that it uh, that it arrives each day as fresh as it did the day before with no, uh, with no one, no real maintenance. Right. So um, now we're incredible creatures. We can do that, but there's a, there's a limit. Um, so here's where I think the problem is. Um, it's, it's something I call the assumption problem. And I think that tra I'm going to traditionally minded leaders think they are investing over investing. Think they are overspending on this human asset. It's called a paycheck. And the, uh, I, or I give you this money, therefore you do all the things. Um, and I, I think that the, the great resignation, you know, there's untold amounts of material on that. I'd, I've been sort of talking about the great reawakening. It's like, we used to know that, um, we used to know how to care for, our, for people. Um, I, I, I don't know if um, you mentioned sort of people-centric organizations. The word company comes from the Latin and through French and I'm, you know, make it, I'm sort of paraphrasing this to make it easy. It basically means the communion around bread. We came together, we made bread together, we all shared in it. We don't come together to make things to share in it anymore. We come together to get a paycheck to make things for, for others gain. Like we've been disconnected from what a company is. A company doesn't employ people. A company is people. Um, and so if you take that mindset, maybe you'll come at this a slightly different way. Maybe you'll start to uh, recognize that, that those assets that basically make up what your company is, and they are by far and away the most valuable things, need looking after. <laughs> that they can't just kind of, you know, you just got to set them, set them loose and expect them to, to refresh every day and, and, and come in, um, you know, updated and ready to go. But the assumption problem is that because I pay for you, I pay you, therefore you will, dot, dot, dot. You will care. You will bring your whole self. You will be effective and efficient and productive. Um, you will bring passion. You will bring energy. I think that if we can re that this reawaken reawakening, this reframing is a paycheck equals attendance. You bought my time. You've bought my so I show up right. I show up at the depot. I show up at the office, or I show up on this little video window that we've all become very familiar with. Everything else after that needs to be earned. And if I can bring this back to the marketing mindset, marketing is about earning attention, earning passion, earning belief, earning caring. And uh, as, a, as a marketer, we are taught uh, from day one a very simple mantra to carry in your head as you walk uh, along your working life. No one gives a shit. No one cares. You, 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 you're launching this thing that you've put your heart and soul into you know, for years and I'm busy and I don't have the time. I'm sorry, I'm walking straight by you. We all do it, right? We're all highly cultured uh, consumers of marketing, branding, messaging, new products, all that stuff um, every single day. And we tune out 
um, subconsciously, like 90 odd percent of it, I can't even remember what the numbers are. We see so tens of thousands of messages a day and you don't even register. Someone put their heart and soul into making that. So if you, you start on the basis that no one cares, you will build a, um, a pathway from ambivalence, from apathy to some kind of interest, to some kind of, of, of belief. What if we started with our employees the same way? No one cares. I mean, we already said that, you know, 60 odd percent are actively disengaged. The data says they don't care. So when you're asking them to do something, start with that apathy and then, and then build to empathy over time. I think where the, the traditional leadership mistake in this assumption problem is we start with empathy and then, and, and then what we want is deep advocacy from there and mm. deep participation. Yeah. You know, you, I, I already got you. How much are you going to do for me versus I need to win you and then um, inspire you, guide you, care for you in order that you do the things that are going to help me as a, as a, as a leader. Yeah. And it's not a one time winning over, right? This is an ongoing thing. Yes. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Academy courses, micro credentials, and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. All HCI Academy courses, micro-credentials, and certificates are designed, developed, and delivered by award-winning and internationally renowned scholars, educators, thought leaders, executives, and practitioners. Our courses, micro-credentials, and certificates will help you make your mark on the future of work and make an immediate impact in your organizations. Check out the HCI Academy and our many course offerings and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. I, I don't, I'm, I've been married a long time, 20 years we've been together. And I categorically know that a strong relationship is not based on one expensive Valentine's meal each, <laughs> right? It's, it's every minute of every day that you're together that you're caring for each other. That's how you yeah. build a strong relationship. And then, you know, yes, sure, have the Valentine's dinner and make it make a special moment of that just to kind of right. to shine the spotlight on how well you're doing. But, you know, the, the one time a year bonus or the one time a year sort of employee event is a Valentine's dinner. Um, and it, it, if you're mean to your partner for the rest of the rest of the year, that Valentine's dinner is going to suck and they're not going to be around very, very much. Longer. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I'm coming up on my 20th anniversary here oh. in about a month. So we're, we're in the same boat there now. Absolutely. And you mentioned a minute ago about, you know, this this old school mindset of I'm investing in you because I'm paying you. So it's like the, the old approach to uh, owning the means of production, right? If we're going to go back in time and talk about economic theory. And that served its purpose for a time in a season, but we're in a totally different kind of an economy. We're in a knowledge economy. We need people who, who, who cannot just go and be a cog in a machine you know, to, to work on the assembly line. We need people who can be creative and energized and innovative and and build upon their human capacity to make connection with other people, we cannot just say, well, I'm investing in you a tremendous amount because I'm paying you. I've, I've heard that just recently from, a, from a, a senior executive at an organization. And they said, payroll is the single biggest item on our budget. Clearly, we value you and clearly we invest in you. 
And the whole time I'm just thinking, whatever, like everything else that you're doing in this organization is creating a, a toxic culture. And of course, people don't feel valued. So, I mean, it, it's this total disconnect. And part of it just goes back to an old model of leadership and old model of organizations that doesn't really apply in the modern work world for most people and most leaders. Um, last last thing that I wanted to, to comment on real quick is what can I do? So I'm trying to take ownership over my own career. Hopefully, you know, my organization is progressive this way and we have HR and marketing mindsets and we have branding mindsets around employee experience and customer experience and the integration of all of that. How can I own this for myself, recognizing that I can't necessarily assume that my employer is going to do it for me to make sure that I'm finding meaning and purpose and driving change within my sphere of influence? It's a, that's a giant question, John. So I'm going to give you the, the marketer's view on it. And, and basically, how do, you, how do you approach every day like a good marketer do, does, which is um, I have to win these people around me to get them to come with me. Because best will in the world, no matter what role you have, you can't make change happen on, its own, on your own. You need, you need people to come along. So um, there's, there's really like three maybe three ways to think about this, three steps in this process that we would, um, that sort of drawn from, from good marketing theory. So the first one, uh, like any strong relationship, what's the, 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 the key of, strong, of, of any strong relationship is listening, um, not talking. Um, I had an a incredible uh, boss uh, who's still a friend and a mentor who say, used to say, you have uh, two ears and one mouth. You should use them in that ratio. Um, and I, I believe in that. So the, the first thing that you are doing is spending time with other people to understand their points of view. Every single person in your organization is a individual and they have, a, you know, they probably have the, the answer to every question that any company would ask exists within the workforce if you actually just spent the time to go and ask. So actually getting out there and listening and understanding, taking a time to, you know, it sounds like a cliche, but to walk in somebody else's shoes to understand what it's like. You know, oftentimes the people you're trying to bring along on the journey of change don't know what you do and you don't know what they do. You don't really know how they spend their time. You meet only in a shared environment, like a workshop or an interview or company meeting. For the rest of the time, you're doing things incredibly different. So um, that, that, that would be step one. We, we would sort of talk about that as, as you know, insight. It's like a, a way of, of getting people to, get, getting you to understand how somebody else to, sort of lives. And I would, if, if, asked what's the one thing a leader can do i always say listen i will say just just take your time to to go and listen and listen to everyone you know have a hundred conversations i know it takes time but you're going to be so much smarter and more more rounded in the decision making if you can have those points of view um in your head as you do that um the the second piece you, you what you're trying to do first is to win over somebody emotionally we are emotional creatures we res we don't respond well to information or instruction you may have experience this in your uh, your life i don't if you if you have uh if you're a parent i am and uh kids don't respond well to the information either they need to be inspired um and so when you have to win someone emotionally before you then um can can sort of if you like instruct them rationally so we use stories storytelling um that one of the biggest uh sort of wins we've had in in, in the work that we do is uh, surfacing stories of other people inside organizations to inspire other employees. Uh, people follow people, not policy is a, is a good sort of takeaway there. So um, building stories that, that, that inspire and winning emotions first. Um, and then when you get into sort of more of the, the, the practical side of it, I think what we're trying to do here is not just train someone because, you know, in, in how to do a new thing, but to embed that new thing into their daily working life. Um, I often think about training like a vacation, right? So you can go over this incredible training experience, but when you come back home, the house is still the same and the washing still needs to get done. And, and, you, and it's like, well, that was great. Anyway, back to normal. I, you know, when we're working with leaders and they do a town hall or there's some kind of like employee experience, it's like, but that is just one moment. You have to then embed this into the daily working lives of, of, of everybody that you're working with, everybody that works for you. Um, you said something interesting about how the, you know, a lot of HR practices are 
you know, antiquated based on a different way of working. I think what's happening today is, yes, we still have um, a lot of roles out there that require repetition, but we're asking people to do more than just repeat. So we take a, a delivery driver for one of the big carriers. We're asking them also to build relationships with their customers in the moments that they have as they drop. That's a new thing. Um, we're asking people to be creative. We're asking people to improve your, your area of work. It's not just turn up, press buttons, or you know, move something from A to B. We're asking you to make the company better. And so I think you have to embed those behaviors into their day and, and help them understand if you do that, what they get back. Um, if you invest that time, if you, if you make that step, this is what, what comes back to you, mostly in impact. Yeah. You know, not asking everyone to you know, suddenly become a profit share recipient of, a, of, of organizational growth. But um, you know, in, in terms of the, the way in which you have your job, your day has meaning to come back to that disengagement point from before. So um, yeah, listen, tell stories, and then build change into daily life, into daily routines. And you, know, you want more on that, read um, you know, Atomic Habits mm -hmm. by John or The Power of Habit by Charles Durig and some incredible examples in there um, of really how, how change really sticks as opposed to uh, how training gives you a moment of something different. Yeah, yeah. Well, Neil, this has been a fascinating conversation. We're going to have to leave it there for now, but we could go on and on and on. I imagine we could talk about this all day long. Um, before we close for today, though, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Love to. Um, so uh, the, the company is local. Um, we're based down here in Atlanta, in Atlanta, but we work with uh, some of the biggest and best companies, you know, uh, around the world. You know, we're in uh, across the country uh, in all different kind of industries. So um, we're very much interested in cultural challenges and change problems that feel complex. I uh, myself and my team like um, cultural complexity and, and enjoy trying to find pathways through that. Um, the if I have a a, a pitch, if you like, to the to the greater, you know, uh, folks working in that HR discipline. It is um, the story we talked about right at the start that these are human beings, and the human beings need um, a rounded uh, way of, of of engaging. Which I think the marriage of that, you know, some of the the progressive HR thinking and some of the progressive marketing thinking together create something really interesting. And um, those, those marketing skills, I think actually will make anybody who looks after people inside companies, um, it will, I don't say make their job easier, but yeah, maybe it will. Um, yeah. We, uh, as an organization, we work on very large long-term programs, but we are also rolling out our um, first training program for non-marketers to bring marketing into their world. Uh, we call what we do change marketing. It is, as it sounds, the marriage of um, progressive change management and everything we know about decades of, you know, world-class consumer marketing rolled into one in an interesting, engaging, um, and kind of practical course. So um, you can find out about that sort of, it's coming in just after the summer on localindustries.com. Wonderful. Neil, it has been a real pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Neil and his team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Check out my new book, The Future Leader, Creating and Transforming Next-Gen organizations. Stemming from two decades of professional experience and over 600 in-depth interviews with executives, thought leaders, and scholars from across the globe, The Future Leader will help you explore the ordinary, everyday actions that will help you to prepare to lead in the future of work, to respond to an uncertain future, and to produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, The Journey of Becoming a Truly Remarkable Leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo, 
If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue, what some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There is no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of your problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for your individuals, teams, and organizations. The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership. Ordinary, everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.